ಸುತ ಕಂಸಚಾಣೂರಮರ್ದನ ಪರಮಂದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ ಐ ಲೈಕ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಐ ನೋಟಿಸ್ ಇನ್ Uh, in my short time at harvard is that people are are open to que- questions so you're expected to think differently think out of the box, box and uh, ask different questions um i am i think i am much more in awe of the professors than the kids are the, the other students uh, for them these are just some old men who are not saying something so they are free to ask questions because it's good there's a there are two different approaches to this in indian philosophy and um, in western philosophy the difference is this um two of the professors in buddhism pointed this out when you look at textbooks in um when you look at the texts of indian philosophy you will find some core texts but you'll find a lot of commentary so you have the upanishads and then you have the commentary of shankara acharya or somebody else and then you have a sub commentary on the commentary so for example the upanishads are there and they are systematized in the sutras called the brahma sutras which are composed by vyasa and the brahma sutras which are aphoristic they are explained in the commentary of say for example shankara acharya there are other commentaries ramanuja's commentary madhva's commentary and so many commentaries and shankara's commentary is commented upon by the sub commentary by padma pada whose commentary sub commentary is commented upon in a sub sub commentary by prakash atmayati and so it goes now in the western tradition uh, it's just the opposite it's not a tradition it's a questioning of tradition here the way of doing philosophy is to not to write a commentary on what your professor told you is to prove that your professor is wrong <laughs> you haven't got it right i'm going to show everybody for the first time that this is the real solution of course my student will show that i am wrong now there are advantages and disadvantages to both the problem of writing commentaries is that it often very soon becomes uh, stagnant so you are basically saying the same thing and being ornamental about it maybe a little more detail little more variation this way or that way it can stifle creativity you might say why do we need creativity we have got the truth and so what what what, do, what else do we need but remember the original texts were people thinking creatively so they thought for themselves and swami vivekananda again and again said and it might be shocking the rishis and all, all those who gave us these texts they are dead and gone you are here you must be rishis rishis means sages you must be sages too we must be sages too so that's the problem with writing commentary the other way of doing philosophy the advantage is that you you're thinking for yourself you're challenging you're coming up with new ideas but the problem is problem becomes very clear when you browse through the papers published in journals especially for example philosophy so people are trying to be different for the sake of being different not that i have a single original thought in my head but i can't get published until i say that this is the greatest thing since kant <laughs> everybody else has been wrong since then and i am the person who what are you saying nothing much actually and i have seen in some cases there are dangers for example in order to prove that i am saying something new and different i have to you know sort of knock down what's been said by earlier people earlier and um blow up the differences uh, exaggerate the differences between what i'm saying and what has been said earlier to show that i am absolutely right so a minor point might be exaggerated beyond belief it's not helpful not helpful it often becomes polemical on one side lies the dead pool of stagnation on the other side the like a 
like a you know like a tornado of whirling a mass of confusion of of attempting to be new each time it's not true you really cannot be new each time so we have to be aware of both sides and, and um, what the two professors on buddhism pointed out was that when we look at philo- texts of indian philosophy the immediate reaction uh, by people studying modern philosophy here is oh it's just commentaries there's nothing new nothing worthwhile there and both professors said no you're wrong commentaries were the way philosophy was done in ancient india for more than 2000 years and while writing commentaries you can be creative and original when you look at the commentaries you begin to see how so for example there's one kind of commentary called the vartika vartika is a, it's a, composed in and imagine uh, doing your philosophy thesis uh, and all in verse one of the professors was joking that uh, uh, all right you're going to turn in your papers um, it's going to be 20 pages of this or it could be 10 pages but it has to be entirely in verse in poetry <laughs> <laughs> so in those days it would used to be in verse um vartika is a, is a kind of commentary sub commentary on in verse So, for example, Sureshwara, one of the great disciples of Shankara Acharya, he is known as the Vartika Kar, the composer of the Vartika commentary. On what? On Shankara's commentary. On what? On the Bhagavad Gita, for example. Uh, there is no Vartika on Bhagavad Gita. The Vartika is on Taittiri Upanishad, Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, you know, um, on the commentaries of Shankara. But what is this Vartika? What's the speciality? what the ori- the original commentator has said i'm going to comment on that okay what the original commentator has left unsaid i'm going to comment on that and what the what has been said in a difficult way i'm going to make things easy ukta an ukta nukta duruktaancha ukta means said anukta means not said durukta means said in a difficult way i'm going to present all of that Uh, so that becomes the purpose but that gives you just a channel the great commentator shankara ha- with all prostrations and bow- and bowing down to him a thousand times but this is a trifling matter which he may have mista- uh, missed and i present something quite different from what shankara says <laughs> they have to know the language of the commentator to understand what's happening so in t- one of the tibetan commentaries we were reading um, the professor pointed out look here this commentator says the one on whom i'm commenting he has said all these things out of his own omniscience this omniscient such and such says these things omniscient sankhapa has said these things you know what it means it means this is not according to buddha it's just something that he has thought about it himself so he is he is an all knowing person so he has written this and it's not right <laughs> So these are subtle things you have to look at in the commentaries. So, for example, when I'm teaching the Bhagavad Gita, I draw upon many commentaries, and they have wonderful insights. The one I'm holding right now is Shankaracharya's commentary. Yeah. Um, one reason I brought it all up was do participate, do ask questions. You can give your own commentary, or you can just blow it all away. It's all wrong. <laughs> Abhatte Sain, whose classes I had the occasion to attend this last. semester he says he once when he was a kid he went up to his teacher in india and said about the bhagavad gita he said can i disagree with krishna can i disagree with krishna and his teacher said of course but with respect <laughs> and he said that that's that's really the hallmark of indian philosophy you can disagree with anything uh, but respectfully all right now so do participate uh, comment ask questions dispute verse number 27 we saw last time and 28 so verse number 27 please chant with me chapter 3 verse 27 prakriti kriyamanani prakriti kriyamanani गुणे कर्माणि सर्वशा गुणे कर्माणि सर्वशा 
ಅಹಂಕಾರ ವಿಮೂಢಾತ್ಮ ಅಹಂಕಾರ ವಿಮೂಢಾತ್ಮ ಕರ್ತಿ ಮನ್ಯತೆ ಕರ್ತಿ ಮನ್ಯತೆ ಆಲ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ಇಸ್ ಡನ್ ಬೈ ನೇಚರ್ ಇನ್ ಆಲ್ ವೇಸ್ ಬೈ ದಿ ಪ್ರೊಡಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ನೇಚರ್ ಬಟ್ ಡಿಲ್ಯೂಡೆಡ್ ಬೈ ದ ಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಈಗೋ ಐಡೆಂಟಿಫಿಕೇಶನ್ ವಿತ್ ಬಾಡಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ದ ಇಗ್ನೋರೆಂಟ್ ಒನ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ದ ಡೂವರ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ವಿ ಡಿಸ್ಕಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಸಿ ಸ್ಟೆಪಿಂಗ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಆಲ್ ದಿಸ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಷನ್ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಗ್ರ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಭಗವದ್ ಗೀತಾ ಈಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಟಾಕ್ಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಾಲಿಟಿ ಇನ್ ದ ಮಿಡ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಲೈಫ್ ನಾಟ್ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಾಲಿಟಿ ಇನ್ ಅ ಕೇವ್ ನಾಟ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಾಲಿಟಿ ಇನ್ ಅನ್ ಆಶ್ರಮ್ ಬಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಾಲಿಟಿ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ಅವರ್ ಡೇ ಟು ಡೇ ಆಕ್ಟಿವಿಟೀಸ್ ಇನ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಇನ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಫ್ಯಾಮಿಲಿ ಇನ್ ಯೋರ್ ಇನ್ ಯೋರ್ ಕಮ್ಯುನಿಟಿ ಎಟ್ ಯೋರ್ ಇನ್ ಯೋರ್ ಕರಿಯರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಕೋರ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಯೋರ್ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಲ್ ಪ್ರಾಕ್ಟಿಸ್ ಟು ಸೊ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ಹೌ ಇಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಲೈಸ್ಡ್ ದಟ್ಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಮೇಕ್ಸ್ ಇಟ್ ರೆಲೆವೆಂಟ್ ಫಾರ್ ಎವ್ರಿಬಡಿ ಅದರ್ವೈಸ್ ಇಫ್ ಇಟ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಸಮಥಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಪ್ರಾಕ್ಟಿಸ್ಡ್ ಬೈ ಮಂಕ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಅ ರಿಟ್ರೀಟ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ರೆಲೆವೆಂಟ್ ಟು ಎವ್ರಿಬಡಿ ಬಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ಸಮಥಿಂಗ್ ದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಇನ್ಸಿಸ್ಟ್ ಆನ್ ಮೇಕಿಂಗ್ ಇಟ್ ರೆಲೆವೆಂಟ್ ಸೊ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ಹೌ ನಾ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಆನ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಹೌ ಇಸ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ಡನ್ ಬೈ ದಿ ಇಗ್ನೋರೆಂಟ್ ಬೈ ದೋಸ್ ಹೂ ಡು ನಾಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಚುವಲ್ ಇನ್ಸೈಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹೌ ಇಸ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ಡನ್ ಬೈ ದಿ ಎನ್ಲೈಟೆಂಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ಫಾಲೋಸ್ ದೆನ್ ದೋಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಅಸ್ ಹೂ ವಾಂಟ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಎನ್ಲೈಟೆಂಟ್ ಹೌ ಶುಡ್ ಬಿ ಆಕ್ಟ್ ಹಿ ಸೇಸ್ ಇಫ್ ಯು ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ ಕ್ವಿಕ್ಲಿ ಸಮರೈಸಿಂಗ್ ವಾಟ್ ವಿ ಸೋ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ಇನ್ ದ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಇಸ್ ಡನ್ ಬೈ ಪ್ರಕೃತಿ ಬೈ ನೇಚರ್ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಪ್ರಕೃತಿ the the source of the universe it's made of according to sankhya cosmology it's made of uh, sattva rajas tra, tamas the three gunas and it produces this universe the five elements and all combinations of five elements and remember when it says this universe it means not only the physical universe of matter space time energy stars and planets atoms and quarks but also our bodies and our minds too thoughts and feelings and emotions and ideas and memories these experiences which we have internally the first person experiences that's also prakriti that's also nature nature has this gross matter sthula and subtle matter sukshma we have a physical body this one and a subtle body our thoughts feelings emotions which we all experience internally all of us what's the distinction between the subtle body and the uh, physical body absolutely clear clear no mystical stuff here no um, esoteric stuff here the physical body is what you can see what the doctor examines not just outside inside also whatever is inside physically if you probe inside it's a physical body but what we all experience privately and not accessible to anybody else the doctor cannot ex- examine it and yet we know for sure it's there thoughts feelings emotions ideas memories desires the this is the subtle body sukshma sharira all of this is matter according to uh, sankhya even the subtle body is matter why the definition of matter is whatever you can experience as this as this object whatever is exp- very elegant definition whatever you can experience as this this room matter this body matter this breath breathing in and breathing out matter this thought this feeling matter or object because this i am brahman this thought is it matter or not it is <laughs> because it is this thought whatever you can objectify is matter even in the subtlest sense even in the most subtle idea you may have in your intellect matter and in deep sleep when everything sh- shut down no experience of the world no experience of the body just a blankness restfulness into which we subside and we come out again we come back and we look back upon it that restfulness yeah, that silence if it's that it still matter so putting it in terms of vedanta annamaya kosha pranamaya kosha manomaya kosha vigyanamaya kosha anandamaya kosha the five levels or the five uh, sheets of the human personality all are matter object thing as much as a thing as this not you the real you the real i is the witness of this of what of this entire physical universe 
of the physical body of the vital body vital body means the prana of the mental body look the word used is used mental the body body is a thing thoughts also manomaya kosha of the intellect vigyana maya kosha and beyond that the deep sleep state ananda maya kosha all kosha means a sheath a covering what is it a covering for the real you what is this real you then what is the real i if it is not matter well if one thing is it is the experiencer of matter it lights up matter it lights up my thoughts feelings emotions it lights up my senses and this body mind complex so the body mind complex lit up by something which is not the body mind complex that is the atman the witness consciousness the good way of distinguishing it would be the when you look in the mirror you see your uh, the mirror and a, a reflected face neither are you the mirror nor are you that reflected face all that reflected face looks a lot like you <laughs> but you are not it because it's this this mirror this face but the actual face is here similarly consciousness you are always there but what we experience is consciousness lighting up the mind and through the mind lighting up the sense organs and through the sense organs this body and this body mind complex there is one function of the mind called ahankara ego literally if you translate it becomes ego maker or i maker ahankara but ego basically what we call the ego the ego has two parts one is the thought i and the other one is like the reflected face in the mirror a consciousness aspect you the consciousness you are reflected in that i so that i seems to be a live i a lit up i it seems to be conscious it really really feels i am right now you see always check with your inner experience i am aware this i am aware this is not you the ignorant the one who had, does not have spiritual insight thinks that this i am this i this i am aware this i consciousness this is who i am and this ego is always connected with the body mind once the ego is there it's connected with the body mind any thought comes up i want some desire comes up it becomes i want look in the mind desire in the mind ego but the two are connected i want ego is i ahankara ahankara as the function the very function of ego is to appropriate unto itself all the activities of one body mind unit i'll repeat that the function of the ego is to appropriate unto itself all the activities in one body mind unit so whatever is going on here the function of the ego its very nature is to say i am this i want this i think this i am this i remember that i forgot that i ate this i went there all activities of life they are all and why does it do that that's a function just like the uh, each organ has its own function the function of the mind that the, the uh, ego is to appropriate it's basically to unite the activities going on to integrate the activities going on in the body and mind in itself not bad here is very something very crucial in itself not bad but there is a problem if we do not know the real i if i have forgotten this is my face i have forgotten this then the only thing remaining before me is the mirror with the reflected face and then i think i am that mirror gets dirty oh my face is dirty mirror is convex oh my face is peculiar mirror is cracked oh my face is cracked no it isn't but we think that and then we suffer that is bound to happen because the very nature of the very nature of nature prakriti very nature of nature is to change the world is changing the body is changing from birth to childhood to middle age to old age to death inevitable 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 the mind is changing all the time all the time fast and if i am identified with any of these then i am in trouble so why should we be in trouble if we are identified with it notice what we all do our entire story of our lives is we are trying to arrange things to our satisfaction that's basically the story of our lives 
We want to arrange the kid arranging the, my toys to my satisfaction. These are the toys I want and this is how it should be. When you grow up a little bit, uh, arrange um, people around uh, to my satisfaction. People in the office and in the family. Very difficult. Impossible. <laughs> then I think I should arrange. I can't change the world. I can't change the people. I can change my life. A little more wise. So I arrange my routine. I'll get up early. I'll exercise. I'll eat gluten-free. And I will, um, uh, I will meditate. I will pray. I will do yoga. And uh, uh, I'll try to arrange. And often I find I fail. My own mind rebels against me. Even arranging my own thoughts becomes, seems to be out of my uh, capacity. And the whole project is also doomed to failure. It has to be understood very carefully. It's not that life is meaningless. But if you do it this way, what will happen is, think about it. Suppose you could succeed. Suppose you succeed. Succeed means I have some sort of idea that this kind of an arrangement is what I want in life. This much money, my people, people around me, family should behave in this way. Boss should behave in this way. My body should behave in this way. My mind should be calm and peaceful. This is what I want. Sounds good. Some are smiling already. Yeah, that sounds really nice. <laughs> don't forget. Don't forget. But nature is always changing. So if you have arranged it to your satisfaction, what will happen next? It will change. Uh, arrangement to my satisfaction the moment it changes the next thing will not be to my satisfaction because I wanted it this way and it changed I want the setup to be this way changed upset <laughs> set up this way not to my liking upset uh, so it's we are condemned to suffer as long as you are identified with the changing body and mind you're condemned to suffer as long as you think I am that reflected face Good news, you are not. You are not the body-mind complex. Which is the place to detach yourself from the body-mind complex? The ahankara, the ego. The finest, the tip of the spear is that ahankara, the ego. I sense with consciousness. If you can know, follow this carefully. If you can even understand, if you can see that I am the witness of the ego then the process of disengagement has begun. A lot of suffering you're released from. I am the witness of the ego. If you're the witness of something, you're not involved. You're not affected. I am the illuminer of the ego. If you're the, I'll come to you. If you're the illuminer, like this light illumines. Notice, it lights up everything, but it's not affected by what's present before it. There could be a book, there could be a clock, there could be a flower, or there could be nothing. It is not affected by that. If you are only that which lights up, once you realize that, then this next step is how do you look back upon life? Krishna says, life will continue. Now the body, mind and the ego continue to do their thing. But as you are not it, you are very clear, I am not it. I am not so desperately involved in trying to arrange things for its benefit. No. Then I am at ease with the way God arranges things. And I make it play the perfect role as far as I can understand. See, ethical life, I would like to lead a very ethical life, becomes a struggle. Why? Because the one which is trying to lead the ethical life, this body and mind, I am so engaged with it, its ups and downs become my ups and downs. But if I am not it, it's something that's operating in my light. Then I can make it lead a perfectly ethical life. Calm, serene, undisturbed, honest, integrated. Why not? So all of these things become possible when I take that one step back. Remember, it's not that you're physically dissociated. After this, no body, no mind, you're just a little bit of light. No. <laughs> now you know the whole story. The body's world is still there, body's family, job, everything is there, body is still there with all its problems, mind is still there with all problems, but you don't have one major problem. What? It's no longer yours. No longer yours. Do you remember the question you wanted to ask? Yes. Right. So, um, 
Thirst is there, there's no doubt about it, because your experience is of thirst. And thirst is something to do with the body, and if you say specifically, it's a prana. Activity of the prana, hunger and thirst are activity of the prana. I am thirsty, a very subtle point. Is it true or not? True. But what Vedanta says, analyze that I. I am thirsty is true. But analyze that I. You are not that I. Think about it. If, if you are a person in your, who's sitting near you says, I am thirsty. Is it true or not? It's true. But you are not thirsty. It's that person who's thirsty. And the thirst of that person is true. And you should give that person a glass of water. Very good. Similarly, if I say, here is this body, mind, and an I, an ego, and it says, I am thirsty, it's reporting thirst in the body mind. Give the guy a glass of water. <laughs> it's analogous. It's still you, but you are not limited to that body mind with the ego. You, it's not all, it's not you, it's not your limit, you are beyond that, you, you are more than that, yes. You can, in the sense that you can put up with it much better. But if you say, okay, I can overcome thirst. Now I am the witness consciousness. I, I am not thirsty. Good. So I won't drink water. Ah, be careful. The witness consciousness is neither thirsty nor does it drink water. Nor does it want to drink water or nor does it not want to drink water. It illumines. The wanting to drink water, it's very natural. It's like saying... I am not thirsty. That guy is thirsty. So I don't need to give that guy any water. No, you need to. If the body is hungry, you need to give food. If the body is uh, thirsty, you need to give water. If the body is sick, you need to give medicine. You need to keep, take good care of the body. But the important thing is to realize it's not you. It's like your car. right? If the car is running out of gas, you need to give it gas. So no, I, I don't need gas. I've realized I'm not the car. All right, you're not the car, good for you. But the car still needs gas, it still needs servicing, it still needs its insurance papers to up, up to date. Do it, but with that, that distance between you and the car. See, this is a very important, this psychological space which opens up. Then you can do what is necessary. But if you push your question to the limit, see, ultimately what you're saying, if I'm not the body and mind, literally, I then am not harmed if the body and mind um, perish out of hunger and thirst. True. True. You are not harmed. But it's also true that if you don't give a drink to the body and a food to the body, it will perish. Body will die. Even then you are not dead. That's, that much is true. So this is an extreme. That, that's what enables you know, people. Don't try it straight away. Yeah. Until the difference is very clear. Um, Swami Pavitranji was here used to say, don't torture the horse you cannot dismount from. <laughs> Even if you can dismount, don't torture the poor horse. Yeah. So you find those who are yogis, they actually take better care of their bodies than us. We overindulge or damage this because we are so involved with this thing, uh, we damage it. Mind. We are so involved with the mind, we actually strain it. We are the one who, we put rubbish into the mind. We damage it with anxieties and complexes because we are involved in the mind. I am it. I am depressed. I am sad. This mind, I am, it, we don't say this mind. I deserve to be happy. I am not happy. Therefore, I, there's a huge complaint that I'm not, why am I not happy? All this is, you're straining the mind. If the mind is left to itself, it's generally happy. I'll come to you. Yes. Do you have to? Yes. How do you separate it? The technique is the observation that if it's an object, the same principle, can you say this ego? But when you say I, the ego is identical to the ego. Yes. I, the ego. Now notice the I, the ego. Are you noticing? And the, you say a good way of noticing would be uh, if you, that's why all these techniques are there. Start with the body first. Be aware of the body. See, our mind needs training. There, 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 all these prakriyas, techniques are given in Vedanta. Yoga is very useful there. Be aware of the body for a while. Then next, be aware of the breath. And there also, so much is to be learned. 
be aware here, breathing in and breathing out. So what has this got to do with philosophy and ego and subtler, slowly, inward, 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 breathing in, breathing out, do it for a couple of minutes. Then be aware of the thought, I am breathing, or some thought. Notice it's a thought. Now you're very subtle. You started with the physical body. You're already at the level of thought. You've already gone beyond the reach of modern medical science. Medical science can go up to your activity of your brains. But the thought, no. You're aware of the thought now. We can make it even more subtle. That understanding, I am aware of my thoughts. You am aware of that also. There, now narrow it down to the I feeling. I and then, what, who or what is saying I, which is not the I? Can you imagine how subtle it is? Any thought that comes up is an object. Even the thought, I am watching the I, it's a thought. You know that you are narrowing on, in on the witness of the I when you, all thoughts become objects. It becomes an intuition. And that intuition is also an object. When you do this, the mind falls silent. It is, the wit it is not even that silence. It's the witness of that silence. You can never ever find out the I, the real I. So, oh, you can't. No, you are it. How will you find it out? Who will find it? Ah, and it's good that you cannot find it. So it's not that there are two eyes. There's only one eye. But the reference of that changes. The reference is body-mind, ahankara, vimura, ignorant. The reference is the witness of body-mind. Ego is in the mind. It's definitely body-mind. If I think I am the ego and I'm limited to that, that's what most of us we are limited to and that's why we suffer. This, this subtle point you're making. Okay, quickly. Uh, last Friday you mentioned the term Chidabhas. Yes. Yes. Chidabhas and ahankar. Chidabhas means shadow of or reflection of consciousness. Chit, consciousness. Abhas, a reflection, shadow. Ahankara, ego. Ego is this I feeling. Notice, it's, I, I can point it out exactly. This I feeling, when you say I, and immediately some thought of body and mind will come up. That's all right. I. Notice that I which you are experiencing, that's the ahankara. Notice that this ahankara is aware. There is an awareness involved. That's also not the original awareness. That's a reflection of awareness. Of what is it a reflection? If you do it seriously, people report every hair on the body stands on the hand. People experience terror. when they, That final turn they make. It's like turning around to look at the face of God. It's right there. We don't see it. Immediate reaction, many place people say, my heart starts uh, racing. That, that ultimate turn. You cannot do it. If you actually do it, if you try to do it, and if you try to do it successfully, you will realize you are it. That's it. And then you have realized the Sakshi Chaitanya, consciousness, witness consciousness. And you are always it. That's the thing. And when you know that you are it, I'll come to you and then you. Remember, it's not that it will prevent you from acting in the world. That's what Krishna is saying. That shining, the mind shines, the ego shines. Consciousness shining, the ego shines. This ego shines when I say, it has two components. Shining and ego. Ego is ahankara, shining is chidabhasa. Ego shining, the mind is lit up. Every thought feels conscious. Mind being lit up, senses are lit up. So every exp perception, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, all of them feel like conscious events. And the body feels conscious. Upanishad says, up to the tip of my nails I feel aware. Ah, nakagrat. Why only tip of my nails? Why not one inch beyond that? Because that is conveyed by the nervous system. Wherever the nervous system is alive, prana is working, it's lit up by. And that lighting up comes from the reflection of consciousness. All right. So, Swami, so um, what all you are explaining is actually kind of mind and right? Yes. And um, how do you dissociate, dissociate yourself from, so you're using the, using the mind to actually enjoy mm. yourself. Yes. So, where is that, how do you dissociate from that gap? You know, I, I get, I get, I get, I get that. Correct. Inside loop there where I'm yes. focusing on the mind. 
Right. It's the mind trying to dissociate itself from the mind. You will never get beyond that. That's the infinite loop. Yes. When you stay with that, a moment of separation will come. A kind of stepping back from the mind. No longer a mind. Mind is still there. It's like there's a you step back into a vastness which is yourself. These are I'm using only language. You can't explain it by language, but clearly. And from that point onwards, forever you know that you are not the mind. You are absolutely free of the mind. Then you can still act with the mind. After that, you can think, feel, imagine, love, hate, be angry, be sad, be all of those things will come and go in the mind. But you know clearly at any moment you can step back into that vastness. You know that it's it's not you. It really has nothing to do with you. It's as much like some dust floating in a ray of light. You are the ray of light in which the dust is floating. Dust is the mind, thoughts, feelings, emotions. You are not even this person. You realize that. You are free of the mind. You are free of this person itself. Person will go on. Yeah, I will stay with that thought. When you say infinite loop, that's the mind trying to dissociate from the mind. Not possible. Not possible. What what is that trying to do? You know, you are trying to dissociate the reflected face from the mirror. You can't. Reflected face and mirror go together. But there is an original face apart from that. That is what we are trying. That last jump. So we are discussing it uh, at at the um, Buddhism classes. This is a famous Chinese thing: the finger pointing at the moon. Yeah. So, all this teaching is finger pointing at the moon. The finger is not the important thing. If you stay with that, then the mind will go into a loop. It will try to be the witness of itself, which it can. It's called introspection, but that's not what Vedanta is about. it that will come and go mind being the witness correct witness or uh, i'm getting it right or wrong one sign is if i feel like a witness sometimes and sometimes i don't feel like a witness that's the mind being a witness that's not the atman that's not witness consciousness witness consciousness is there all the time and it's always a witness one just has to note it you don't have to become a witness The ego sense is. No, no. Um, the, remember, the, in the story of the Buddha, the pious came before realization. <laughs> he had, if you remember the story, he was um, uh, starving himself for days on end, and then he had uh, fainted. Uh, too much austerity. Mm-hmm. Then Sujata uh, was there, and so uh, gave him pious. Pious is the rice pudding, yeah. rice pudding. Mm-hmm. And then he recovered his strength, and he came to this nice conclusion that too much of extremes is not good. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then he sat for meditation, mm-hmm. and then at, at the end of that night's watch, he became enlightened. So. So we need the, the conclusion is we need rice pudding. But this is a good question, you know. Yeah. We are forgetting everything, and again we come back. You need not go into philosophy for that. Every day that happens. When you fall asleep, you forget everything. Everything is gone, and it all comes back. So it's not that everything goes away and comes back. Everything is still there. Yeah. That now, what only the thing which happens upon enlightenment is you realize you are not it. But it's not an alienation or a dissociation. It's rather seeing everything total, the totality of things for the first time. earlier the difference between witness consciousness and ego ahankara and sakshi was not clear now the difference between ahankara and sakshi is clear 
I am the Sakshi, the witness consciousness. But the ahankara is still there. The mind is still there. The body is still there. This is, uh, leads to confusion. See, the way it is put in many, many texts that the ego has to be killed. The, you have to overcome the ego. When the ego dies, it's done. Sri Ramakrishna has also said that it has to be carefully understood. Otherwise, it can lead to confusion. The ego still functions. But you are not the ego. The, the, this desperate clinging to the ego as I and me and myself, that clinging is broken forever. That's called overcoming of the ego. So you prove it, you're giving your own interpretation. So many great sages have said that ego has to be killed. Ego, you have to go beyond the ego. There's no ego anymore. Look at the very words of Sri Ramakrishna or Ramana Maharshi or any other great saint you want. Do they not use the word I? They seem to use it differently from us. But they use the word I. And think about it logically. After enlightenment, is the body there or not? Yes, it is there. If the body is there, are the kidneys functioning? Or the kidney will stop after enlightenment? If the body is there, kidney is functioning, heart is functioning, lungs are functioning, brain functioning, brain dead after enlightenment? <laughs> Do you actually have discussions? Um, uh, in uh, One of the discussions in our uh, Tibetan Buddhism class was the two models of Buddhahood. After nirvana, what happens? So look at where we are sitting, a bunch of professors and grad students thinking, what is the condition of the Buddha? We're still worried. <laughs> 2,500 years later. <laughs> so one of the models is, no, the Buddha has no thought at all. Beyond all thoughts. There's no, like us, what we feel and think, there's nothing like that. So in the name they called it brainstem Buddha. Only brain stem is left. Only body is, heart is beating and lungs, but nothing else. That does not seem to be a very attractive enlightenment. <laughs> if you're just sort of brain dead, you have to do so much uh, of uh, tapasya to attain that state. No, no, no. That's not what it means. The enlightened person is, is more capable, more active, more fully alive than others. The Buddha said, see what a travesty it is to think like that. The Buddha said when Buddha was asked first time, He's walking to Sarnath to give the first sermon, first talk. And this little shepherd boy sees him and asks, Not who are you, what are you? Houston Smith says, so many people have been asked who are you. But very few people in history have been asked, what are you? And the, Are you a god? Buddha said, no. Are you a, one of the heavenly beings, angels? No. Are you, um, uh, are you a human being? Buddha says, no. Then what are you? He says, I am the awakened, I am the Buddha. Meaning thereby, he is claiming that he is the, for the first time awakened. He is fully aware. Compared to him, we are either sleepwalking or in dream or half aware or whatever it is. I'll come to you both of you. Yeah. Right. In fact, uh, that is one of the issues that was discussed also. Uh, because many of the texts keep talking about the omniscience of the Buddha. Now this also is uh, interesting. So there are so many interesting issues. I just mentioned a couple of things here to, for your food for thought. When it says the Buddha becomes omniscient, in Jainism also, the jina is the, the ultimate development in spiritual life. The jina is supposed to be omniscient. Full flowering of knowledge. What is omniscience? So knowing everything in detail, so you know all the encyclopedias and uh, you know it's all memorized, everything is, uh, you know everything in detail. What everybody's thoughts are, what uh, uh, the little ant at the bottom of the stairs had for dinner today. Every little thing in the universe you know. No, that's a claim. Yes, the Buddhas know things happening in this world and all the worlds. Maybe they're not thinking about it all the time, but it's accessible, available to them, everything. That's one idea. And these claims are made in Buddhism. The word is Sarvagya. 
Sarva means everything, Gya means knower or knowledge. In Vedanta, what is the Vedantic position? I'll just give it to you for just something to think about. I think it's a very logical position. Vedantic position is that no. The enlightened being knows that I am Brahman. Everything is Brahman. I am one with the world. There is only one reality, Brahman, and everything is an appearance. So whatever an experience is an appearance in media awareness. That's what the enlightened being knows. But does that enlightened being know physics, chemistry, and biology? Does that enlightened being have all the Nobel Prizes in the world? Um, has read all the papers in every subject? No, no. Not in detail. Not in detail. So is that possible at all, omniscience? According to Vedanta, it's possible. For example, uh, in, in Vedanta, God is omniscient, Ishwara. What is God? Same consciousness, but with the upadi, with the associated with Maya. Maya is the producer of everything. According to what we were just reading, Prakriti produces everything. Because Maya produces everything, and Maya is the associate or the power of Ishwara, God is omniscient. God knows everything in detail. And Vedanta also claims that there can be yogis who are not omniscient like God, but there are vast realms of knowledge open to them because of their spiritual practices. They can know a lot of things beyond our... Um, yeah. Such yogis may be fully enlightened or may not be enlightened. They, but they may know. And an enlightened being may not know things in detail. If you go to an enlightened... Are you enlightened? Can you tell me what I am thinking right now? Maybe that person can. I have met people who can. Maybe that person cannot. But what that person knows is that I am Brahman and all of this is an appearance in Brahman. Brahman alone is the reality. That it knows. So how do you explain the word Sarvagya? Sarva means everything. Gya means knowledge. Sarvagya means one is one who knows everything. That's one meaning. That's the usual meaning. Other Vedantic meaning is Sarva means, Sarvagya means, Sarva means everything. You are everything. And how? Gya as knowledge, as consciousness. As consciousness, you alone are everything. See, if this golden ornaments, ornaments made of gold. Now, whatever ornament comes, you can say one thing for sure. It's made of gold. But what kind of ornament comes? What new innovative ornaments are produced? It depends on the skill and creativity of the goldsmith. But this much you know. Whatever that person does, newer and newer kinds of ornaments, it must be gold. In the same way, the enlightened person knows whatever maya throws, whatever life throws at you, Oh, it's nothing. It's Brahman. I am that also. That much is clear. That's enlightenment. So this is the difference. I think um, I, when I was hearing these discussions, back and forth, how can the Buddha be omniscient? Either, see, the two extreme op options. Buddha is like the greatest encyclopedia in the world who knows everything. Or Buddha is a brainstem uh, in coma who knows nothing. This distinction has to be clear. Uh, all right. You and me, brother. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not easy. It's a vast amounts of practice has gone into being the ego. And so it's a lifetime of, lifetimes of practicing being the ego. So we are very naturally, we are experts at being the ego. That's why it's difficult. And that's why all spiritual practice becomes useful. Notice, what does karma yoga, karma yoga do? It makes you expand the ego. Not just me. My ego is much less important than doing things for others. Unselfishness is basically trying to loosen the grip of the eye on the ego. Or the ego on the eye. Unselfish. Karma yoga. Bhakti yoga. It makes the yoga, uh, ego bow down to the, to the Lord. Thou, not me. Swami Premananda. Beautifully. One of the reminiscences. Swami Premananda who was direct disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. The first manager of Belurmat. Often he would ch chant. Naham, naham, tuhu, tuhu, not me, not me, thou my lord, thou my lord. That's bhakti yoga. What is raja yoga? Stop. You're telling the ego, stop. No, this and that, stop. Absolute quiet. That's also shutting down the ego. And finally, ra the jnana yoga, the path of knowledge, when you say the ego is not me at all. So the ego has been thinned out, weakened, loosened by the, all the other practices. 
But if you want to jump straight to Vedanta, without the other practices, I'm grasping tightly, I'm grasping the ego. And then you say, I'm not the ego. How? This student, I'll see you, I'll, I'll ask you. The student goes to the teacher and um, says, Master, teach me. Teach you what? How to free myself. Make me free. So, all right, I stay. And then every day the student would go to the cave and um, the master would make him do little chores, you know, clean the cave, go and beg for food in the village and things like that, cut firewood for me. The student thought, he's just exploiting me. He's not teaching me how to be free. So after a month, he came and gave an ultimatum to the master. Master, you must teach me how to be free. Otherwise, from tomorrow, I'll go and look for another master. I won't come to you anymore. And the master said, all right, tomorrow I will set you free. Come. Early morning, take a bath, um, fast, get your mind ready, calm, peaceful, come to me at this time. So he goes early in the morning and sees the master standing outside the cave. This is old, dried tree trunk outside the cave. The master is... Um, grasping it tightly and saying, set me free, set me free, set... And the student said, just let go. The master said, precisely. <laughs> Swami Vivekananda in his poem, Song of the Sannyasin, Thine only is the hand that holds the rope that drags thee on. Let go thy hold, Sannyasi bold. Say, Om Tat Sat Om. Easier said than done. We hold on to it with a death grip. We don't know how to let go. Start with letting go in small things. Objects, gadgets, um, things in the world. Our death grip on people we want to control. Let go of that. Loosen. Then even more subtle. Let go of my prejudices, preconceptions. My idea. So sometimes what happens... If you see the lives of academicians, stop, Nobel Prize winner, winner. Very simple person. Not too many possessions, not too many. Um, uh, you know, mind is uh, involved in higher thought. But challenge any of his ideas, oh my God. And he's going to let you have it. Because now that mind is holding on with all power to a few of my idea. My theory. My money, my car, I don't care. You take it. But it's, it's a more evolved mind. But still. So let go. True. Starts early. But the thing is, early means what? Early has been childhood. But we are thinking of terms of many, many lives earlier also. <laughs> so there are people who have started early. Early means many lives ago. So we used to say, we have a saying in our order and in other sadhus also. When you see a very good monk, uh, I've heard it said by senior monks, when you say, how could it be like this? So about Swami, for example, Swami Ranganathanandaji. When he was a brahmachari, even a novice at the we were novices at that time, I'm 20 years back, so we used to think about that. We have heard how Swami Ranganathananda, when he was at our stage of monastic life, um, he would wash the dishes, he, at the same time, he would be memorizing the Viveka Chura Mani, things like that, you know. Um, incredible. Physical work, devotional, intensely intellectual, memorizing scripture after scripture. I have seen his notebooks, he didn't have money to buy books. So he would write it down, copy it down with a pencil. How is it possible? After a hard day's work, I asked a Swami, how is it possible? After a hard day's work, I have no desire to read Vedanta anymore at night. I mean, I'd rather read a little bit of Reader's Digest and go to sleep. How is it possible for this Swami to do that? And then he said, are they sadhus of one life? In Bengali he said, okay, on the opposite end, a monk, very, I still remember, very humorous. Um, <laughs> he's a huge guy, very powerfully built. He was in charge of the kitchen of a hospital. More than a thousand patients, hundreds of nurses and doctors and all of that. Enormous responsibility. But very interesting, Swami. And he said once, I still remember, he's le leaning towards me. I was a patient. So he's leaning to, it come to me and he said, uh, leaning towards me. And said, I'll, 
I'll tell you a secret, let you into a secret. This is not only my first life as a monk, it's my first life as a human being. <laughs> I was an animal in my last life. So I'm very, very grateful that <laughs> I've been, <laughs> like double promotion straight away. <laughs> yeah. So yes, but to answer your question early, but that does not mean I'm, I'm seeing the glimmer that I'm going to put my son and daughter on this track. <laughs> be, be very careful. Of imp One thing you should not do is impose on children. You can give a structure and give good ideals to children when they're young. A little older, don't. Hmm. Yes, it's late is difficult, but not impossible again. It depends on some scars. Swami Advaita Nandaji, who was Sri Ramakrishna's disciple, was older than Sri Ramakrishna when he came to Sri Ramakrishna. And he became an enlightened Brahmagyani. And there are any number of young children who become monks um, in uh, especially Thailand and Tibet. So from childhood onwards they are monks. So they all get nirvana like Buddha? Not at all. I, so I am full of these stories. Anyway, let me just tell one more and then we'll go do at least one more verse. Two more verses. Um, this story was told to me by Swami Divyananda, who's the head of our uh, big ashram outside Belurmat. And he's a very big Swami, he's a huge, well built. He told me that once he was going in a train, and this young Buddhist monk was sitting next to him and started talking. The young, very young, maybe in his teens, or, and said, Are you a Hindu monk? And Swami Divyananda said, Yes. He has a very booming voice, you know, Yes. <laughs> and then he said, I am Buddhist. Good. Um, Buddhism is better than Hinduism. <laughs> Who told you that? <laughs> my master. My master told me. My teacher told me. All right. And then they went on talking. And slowly the young monk warmed up to Swami Divyananda and then opened up, uh, started talking about his experiences and all. And then his in life. And finally said, can I ask you something? Yes. How does one stop being a monk? <laughs> Why? See, I became a monk before I realized anything. They put me in this. And I don't want to be a monk. <laughs> what do I do? Dibyandi said, ask your teacher. <laughs> <laughs> if you start very early, are you going to be enlightened? Not at all. Not necessarily. But yes, overall, good point. Starting early is better than starting late, yes. I remember when I was a little kid, my mother and my aunt used to scold me. You are a child. You should go and play and study. This is the time. And why are you going to the ashram and uh, you are reading these philosophy books and all? And they, so I just sat quietly. And then they left the room. My grand aunt was sitting in a corner. She was old, uh, in her 80s, 70s or 80s, a widow. She called me, come here. I think I was 10 years old or something. And she said to me, it's much better you start early. In old age, it's very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, don't listen to them. <laughs> but also don't tell them that I told you this. <laughs> I still remember. I still remember. Isn't it the practice yes, yes, of course. Uh, of course. I'm giving you the counter arguments, but... Well, your initial statement is absolutely right, yes. It's always better to start whenever and wherever you are. And if you say it's good to start when you're children, yes, certainly, certainly. So inclined, yeah. Just don't force children. That can be counterproductive. 28. So, now how does the enlightened person act? 28. Tattva vittu mahabaho Tattva vittu mahabaho Guna karma vibhagayo, guna karma vibhagayo, guna gune shuvatante, guna gune shuvatante, iti matva na sajjate, iti matva na sajjate, tattva vittu mahabaho, O mighty armed one, who is that? Arjuna. Tattva vit, the knower of the truth. What is the knower of the truth? I am not the ego. I am the witness of the ego. If I'm not the ego, then I'm clearly not the body-mind complex also. Which is there, doing its thing, but I'm not it. 
that is the one who knows this knows this means it all clarity not just read about it what does he know guna karma vibhagaya the the entire world is a product of the gunas of prakriti of the constituents of prakriti everything is made of uh, of nature of uh, in according to sankhya sattva rajas tamas and its products what are the products the five elements and their combination and stars and planets and bodies and minds all of that is guna karma and all activities are being performed in this nature walking talking uh, running sitting even thinking meditating loving hating all prakriti all within the realm of body and mind all within the realm of ego So Ram Krishna is to say Maya Relaka, the field of Maya. But I am the light which lights all this up. I am not involved in any of it, though it's all in appearing in me. Now Madhusudan Saraswati, one of the commentators, he says, Guna Karma Vibhaga. Guna means the products, the constituents of nature. Karma means the activities going on there, all action, because the whole thing is about action. All action is in prakriti in nature. vibhaga he says li- li- literally vibhaga means the distinction or the difference but madhusudan saraswati commentary another commentary see very respectfully he says he dis- dif- differs a little from shankara he says vibhaga here means the witness consciousness that which is different from these two It, the word vibhaga means different what what is different not the difference between guna and karma action and the constituents of nature constituents of nature nature and the action and that which is different from these two you the consciousness the one who knows this what is the attitude of the enlightened person guna guneshu vartante the constituents of nature are acting with the constituents of uh, nature are interacting and playing with that nothing to do with me the body and mind are products of nature and the food that i eat the things that i see the sounds that i hear and the people i interact with they are also products of nature and these are products of nature interacting with products of nature not i so knowing this iti matwa knowing this na sajjate does not get mixed up does not get into the into the 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 mess there but it's a very subtle point because it's not that that person stops acting oh i will not get mixed up i will sit in my room and i'll watch everything as a witness vedanta taught me i'll watch everything through a window <laughs> no you are actually not involved in all of this that's what you realize and the body goes on doing its work the mind goes on doing what it's supposed to do this an epiphany. an epiphany a breakthrough and then stay like that because what will happen after that is again the body and mind will try to subsume you because of the habit of many lifetimes then the practice will now be to remain centered practice is broken into two parts divided into two parts first part is seeking trying to get that epiphany reading meditating um, thinking it through practicing all kinds of spiritual disciplines seeking 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 then you may have that epiphany but after that also the same practice is continue but now the objective is not to find it you have found it that i am the witness consciousness you know now what is meant by this but remaining centered in it not getting swept away by the practices by the habits of many lifetimes that's also a practice that's why tota puri the teacher of ramakrishna sri ramakrishna every day would remain immersed in samadhi for some time ramana maharshi also all the great masters you will notice even when they are teaching their day is divided into the cycles of withdrawal and interaction they withdraw and then they intensely interact with everybody and then again withdraw na sajjate do not get caught up do not get mixed up then number 29 prakrite guna sammudha prakrite guna sammudha sajjante guna karmasu सज्जन्ते गुणकर्मसु तान कृष्ण विदो मंदान तान कृष्ण विदो मंदान कृष्ण विन्ना विचालयेत कृष्ण विन्ना विचालयेत इज समिंग अप द एंटायर डिस्कशन हियर इन 29 
in contrast to this ignorant. So 27, 28, 27 was the ignorant person who gets mixed up in it. 28 was the enlightened person who, while acting, does not get mixed up in it. And 29 again, first line is about that ignorant person who gets mixed up in it. Prakriti guna sammura, deluded by the gunas of prakriti, by the constituents of prakriti and their products. Sajjante guna karmasu, the ignorant get mixed up, attached to activities and the products of prakriti. Products of prakriti means nothing other than body mind. Body, thoughts, mind and ego. Ahankara, mind, body, all of that. Then, to such people, what should, should, what should we do? Tana krishna vidho mandan. To those, mandha literally means the slow ones. To these slow ones, why are they slow? Akritsnavid, who do not have complete understanding. The one of complete understanding, Kritsnavit, what should you do? Navichalayet, don't disturb them. Don't literally do, disturb them, don't make them restless, don't damage them. Sri Ramakrishna used to say, Bhab nashtakurteni. You may know better, you may know a deeper truth. Unless you have the power to make that person spiritual, give that person enlightenment, if you don't have, don't damage them. Let them grow. What you can do is give them an upward push. If they are willing to listen, if, they have, if you have any say at all in the matter, always show them, tell them and show them by your la life an upward, a better way of doing things. From unethical to ethical. From ethical to unselfish. From unselfish to spiritual. From spiritual to uh, realization, enlightenment. Give them an upward push. Whatever people need at that point. Don't disturb them. Yeah. I am going to um, be happy. How? I'm going to earn a million dollars in Wall Street. No, no, no. That will not make you happy. Uh, that is all changing. Don't you know that uh, nature changes? Buddha said everything is transitory. So if you get a million dollars also, that will also go away and it will be unhappy at the end of it. Don't try. Come to the ashram and meditate. Hopeless. <laughs> you will hurt that person. Why? First of all, what you are saying is true. Because it's true, it will have an effect on the person. And yet, when there is an intense desire for something, I really, really feel if I were rich, I would be happy. Then the only way of, for that person is to go and work it out. Encourage them in action. In our own case also. I understand everything, but I have some overwhelming desire for something. Then what? Do it. I'll tell you something which monks generally don't tell, but it's true. You can even ask God for it. We, we tell just the opposite. Don't ask for worldly things to God. You can even ask God for worldly things. I want to be famous. I want this project to be successful. I want to get a promotion. I want to get money. I want to get well. You can ask. But there is a reason why we don't advise this. Because you are asking for samsara, you will get samsara. God, the Lord will satisfy your desire. But if you ask for it with, with this awareness, with this awareness that yes, it will not satisfy me. I will still be in samsara. Unhappiness will continue. But I need to work through this. There is a stage. Such people need to work through it. Then work through it. Be done with it as soon as possible. Sri Ramakrishna himself, himself uh, demonstrated. The shawl, he saw people walking around with expensive shawls and he, he asked Mathur Babu, can you get me an expensive shawl? And he got a very, very expensive shawl from Banaras, silken and with, with uh, ornamentation and everything. So Sri Ramakrishna put it on and walked around proudly, you know. And then he told his mind, oh mind, see, this is called an expensive shawl. <laughs> and people put this on and become proud and forget God, become egotistic and forget God. The moment he said this, he said, fie on such a thing which makes me forget my divine mother. He took it out and threw it on the ground. Not satisfied, he jumped on it. <laughs> Not satisfied, he spat on it. And then he was about to set fire to it when it was luckily <laughs> snatched away and rescued from him. It was a very expensive shawl. <laughs> now move like that. That's an extreme example, but move like that. If you make your first $100,000, don't wait for it to become a million dollars or two million dollars. You know 
one one person pretty successful top level executive he said he had that epiphany he was going all out for it he had the epiphany that just a minute i've got what i wanted but when i paused and i thought there are so many people who are richer than me and there are so many people he put it this way when i got the bmw that's what how he put it when he got the bmw he said but i know people who have a yacht and they know people who have private jets there is no end to this if you win the rat race you're still a rat <laughs> intelligent person will stop enough for my own uh, purposes will do i know a person young person who became a monk um so american young american man he was a brahmachari and, and uh, he said that um he had given up whatever he had earned in his life and he was less than 30 i said i have just um put made a trust and people will give that money away i said trust how much money did you give away this young man who is in his 20s he donated 10 million dollars he was one of those dot com multimillionaires and he gave it all away that's progress he doesn't even think that is doing something really great being a great philanthropist it just he doesn't need it anymore he's moving ahead hmm. all right do not disturb encourage from wherever they are little better you may know i do not do anything don't tell them that you actually do not do anything you think you are going to earn a million dollars you don't you are the witness consciousness of the body and mind earning <laughs> you just harm people come to the ashram give up all this nonsense that's why we do not directly encourage monastic life you'll be surprised in vedanta in hinduism monastic life is is only a specialization it's not for everybody and it's not even necessary for everybody what is necessary for everybody is spirituality everybody has to be spiritual should be spiritual wherever they are and whatever they are doing but this making monasticism open it happened at some phases of indian uh, history uh, there was a phase of jainism when it was very popular in the south for example buddhism was very popular at one one time and i'm talking about india so one time meant uh, 1500 years ago <laughs> very popular but you open up the shop to all of that then what happens is it's bad for society it's bad for that person who's becoming a monk and not fit to be a monk damages his or her own spiritual progress and it's bad for monasticism too the whole thing declines then and that we have experienced for over centuries so it is um, don't disturb people what krishna is saying make them enlightened so advaita vedanta i'll summarize action is of two kinds one is for the spiritual seeker on the path to realization it is called karma yoga and the other one is for the enlightened person action it is called loka sangraha welfare of the world from a advaitic perspective for the enlightened person the enlightened person is doing work in the world it's not karma yoga from an advaitic perspective it is actually gyana yoga it's a manifestation of enlightenment then it's true brahma pranam brahmavi that chant which we chant we chanted before food but it's actually meant to show how an enlightened person works seeing brahman in all action that is gyana yoga that is enlightenment that's not even karma yoga so this is these are the two models of karma in gita in bhagavad gita in vedanta yes om shanti 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 हरि ओ तत्सत्ीरा कृष्णापणमस्तु